So in this video we want to look at a more complicated uh, volume between two surfaces example. So set up a double integral to calculate the volume of the solid region bounded above by the paraboloid z equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared and bounded below by the plane z equals 1 minus x. So two things to notice right away about this. This is a paraboloid opening downwards. It's easy to see if we write it as z equals 1 minus parentheses x squared plus y squared. So we have a paraboloid being reflected downwards and it has a vertex on the z-axis of 1. The plane z equals 1 minus x is missing the y variable. So this plane is going to be running parallel to the y-axis. So we know two pieces of information just by thinking about those two things. The first thing that we know is that this has symmetry with respect to both the xz and the yz planes. And here, because we're parallel to the y-axis, we actually have symmetry with respect to the xz plane. So we're going to be able to use symmetry to help in the volume calculation. We don't have as much symmetry as we did in the case where we looked at uh, the volume under a paraboloid uh, without a bounding plane, but we do have some symmetry going on that will simplify the calculations a little bit. The thing that you want to know if you know that you're bounded above and below by something, we need to know what the intersection of the uh, of the boundary, sorry, the intersection of the surfaces looks like because the uh, shadow of the intersection in the xz plane is going to be your bounding region over which you have to integrate. So the way that you uh, find out what the intersection of the surfaces looks like is you just set the surfaces equal to each other. So in this case I set 1 minus x squared minus y squared equal to 1 minus x. Some things to notice about this, it would be easy to solve this for y if we needed to. For, so for example I could get y squared equals by adding y squared to both sides subtract the 1 from both sides, add x to both sides, we could get y squared equals x minus x squared, which could be useful because this would allow us to solve for y. So this is a useful way of looking at the intersection of those two regions. But it, we, we actually want to know what this intersection looks like. We're trying to visualize it. So what I would do is add the x squared plus y squared to both sides. So if I did that, they'd be, I'd have a minus x, so I'd have x squared minus x. Subtract the 1 from both sides, that goes away. So we get x squared minus x plus y squared equaling 0, just through algebraic manipulation. And then what I would want to do is complete the square on this term. So half of negative 1 is negative 1 half squared is a quarter. Add a quarter to both sides recognize that one quarter is one half squared and by completing the square I get x minus one half quantity squared plus y squared equals one half squared. So I recognize this is the equation of a circle. The intersection of the two surfaces is the equation of a circle but in the x and in the xy plane, sorry, that's going to look like, well, the center of it's going to be at one half zero. So we're going to have a circle with radius one half centered at one half zero. So this is nice because the circle has symmetry with respect to the x axis, which means the circle has symmetry with respect to the x z plane, and that's going to be important for us. So I really want to integrate, what I want to integrate to find the volume between two surfaces. If I have a surface above and a surface below, so we think back to Algebra 1 when we wanted the area between two lines, we took the top line minus the bottom line and then we multiplied by our dx. Well in this case, we're going to be multiplying by dy dx but we're going to want the top surface minus the bottom surface. So it's the same principle. We're going to need to do top surface minus bottom surface. So it's going to be the double integral. It's going to be the upper surface, which is 1 minus x squared minus y squared, 
minus the lower surface, which, which is just a 1 minus x. And then we're going to need to make a decision whether we are doing dy dx or dx dy or not. And the idea is because if here's my z axis, both of these equations have x z plane symmetry. I'm actually going to want to res uh, integrate with respect to dy first and then with respect to dy. Because if I take a dy um, integration first, instead of integrating from here to here because of the x z plane symmetry, I'll be able to integrate with respect to uh, the x axis and the upper half of the circle and I won't have to have a square root on my lower bound of integration. So at this point, let's just take a look at the graphs in GeoGebra and maybe help ourselves visualize things a little bit more. So I'm going to escape and keep my changes. I don't want to lose those. So in GeoGebra, here's the surfaces we're working with. We have, I get the positive x axis, there's the positive x axis right here. So the plane is right here and the y variable was missing. So that plane is running parallel to the y axis and it has symmetry with respect to the x z plane. And the paraboloid opening downward also has x z plane symmetry. So you can see that the volume, uh, the volume we uh, of the uh, the volume between the two surfaces, that's going to be between the paraboloid is on top and then the plane underneath is the bounding region underneath. So I'll be able to find the um, volume over here and just double it. If I get it, if I get the if I get the volume to the right of the XZ plane, I can double it to get the volume from both sides of the XZ plane. So I want to take advantage of that XZ plane symmetry. And then I said on the PowerPoint slide that I had a circle of radius one half centered at one half zero as my bounding region. And you can see that really well in GeoGebra. The bounding region, what we did is we found the intersection of the two surfaces, but we want the shadow of that in the XZ plane. And we look down at the XZ plane, the shadow of it is that circle of radius one half centered at one half zero. So the, the GeoGebra allows you to visualize the region of integration very easily, which is which is a nice a nice feature. What I and again what I did to do that is I use this intersection of two surfaces tool. I intersect the plane with the paraboloid to get the intersection that gave it to me here in blue. But if you want to get an idea of what it looks like in the XZ plane, you just flip yourself up so you're looking at the XZ plane so your eyesight is perpendicular to that plane and there's that bounding region. And what we want to do is integrate from the um, X axis up to the upper uh, upper half of the circle and take advantage of symmetry instead of going from the negative square root to the positive square root we can go from zero to the square root. You don't always have symmetry to, to bail you out, but in this case we do have nice symmetry with respect to the XZ plane. We don't have symmetry with respect to the YZ plane. So if I go back to the region I'm working with, I want to set up my bounds of integration. So I want to I want to think about this two different ways. I want to be able to think about this pretty flexibly. I'm going to be integrating with respect to dy first. So I'm going to run from the line y equals zero, which is the x-axis, up to the upper half circle, which I can solve for easily right here. I have y squared equals x minus x squared. We can solve for that easily as y equals the square root of x minus x squared. So we would be running up to this upper half circle is the square root of x minus x squared. So x minus x quantity squared. And then in the, along, the interval along the x-axis is just going to run from 0 to 1. So from 0 to 1. And we could actually solve for that by setting y equal to 0 and saying where on the x-axis will y be equal to 0. So if we set y equal to 0, then we get x squared minus x equals 0 and x times x minus 1 equals 0, so x equals 0 or 1 would be 
our solution, so we would be running from zero to one along the x-axis if we solve for it that way. So that sets up the integral. It needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but before we just dive into it, I want you to recognize that the completing the square version, we could also solve for y using this. And if we did that, we would get y equals the square root. We'd have one half squared minus, it'd be x minus one half squared. So x minus one half quantity squared and we would take the square root of both sides. So the square root of x minus x squared is the same as the square root of 1 half squared minus x minus 1 half squared. And if we're going to have to do a trig sub, which we will, this might be the more useful way of thinking about it, whereas this might be the cleaner way of thinking about it. So it just says set up, but let's push this through a little way. So instead of just dot, 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 let's push it a little bit further. So we get the integral from zero to one and from zero to the square root of x minus x squared. And then we clean this up a little bit. We're gonna get one minus one is zero. Minus minus will give us an x. So I'm gonna have an x minus x squared minus y squared. And this is dy dx. And if we're integrating with respect to dy first, we're holding this piece constant. So when we integrate, we get the integral from zero to one times, we're gonna have x minus x squared, the constant. My computer's trying to freeze up on me, so I'm hoping to, I wanted to go dot, dot, dot and call it done. I'm hoping to get through a little bit more before it freezes. So one, and we integrate this, we're gonna get one third y cubed, and this should look similar to the paraboloid video that we did a little bit ago. And this is going to run from zero to x minus x squared is to the half or the square root and we still have the dx because we haven't integrated with respect to dx first. We notice that when we plug in the zero for our lower bounds it zeroes out so we just need to plug this in. So if I get the integral from zero to one I'm going to have x minus x squared to the first times x minus x squared to the half. It's just going to be x minus x squared to the three halves minus one third x minus x squared to the half cubed is going to be another x minus x squared to the three halves, and this is all a dx, and I have one of these minus one third of them is going to be two thirds. So this is playing out very similar to how the previous paraboloid video did. We're getting two thirds of an x minus x squared to the three halves, and the two thirds is a constant and can be factored out front, and we still have the dx. And this, this would require a trig sub to tackle it. And if you're tackling a trig sub, this form right here is gonna be more useful than uh, the x minus x squared form, because when I go to set up my triangle, where do I have room to set up a triangle? Most of it I saved, so now it's a GIF or JPEG, so I can't erase it. So I set up my triangle. If I'm doing a trig sub, and this is theta, I have, oop, it's hypotenuse squared minus leg squared, so the hypotenuse is a half. The other leg's gonna be x minus a half. And then the third, the, the second leg here is the one half squared minus the x minus one half squared, but we wanna recognize that, that is, this right here is the same as the square root of x minus x squared. They're the same thing. The nice thing about the completed the completing the square form is it, sh it tells us very easily how to label the hypotenuse and the leg opposite. So we'd work this through just like we did in the paraboloid video. I, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, hey, look, this looks like a half of a cosine of theta is equal to the square root stuff, the x minus x squared. But I need I, I I'm going to need um, that square root cubed, right? This is the square root being cubed. So if we cube this, we get an eighth of the cosine cubed, it's really starting to freeze on me now. I get an eighth of the cosine cubed right here. And then from this side, I'm gonna get one half, I'll do it right here, I get one half sine of theta equals x minus one half. So when we take the derivative, we get a half 
of the cosine of theta and it's going to be d theta dx. I'm going to multiply both sides by the dx and the derivative of the right hand side is just 1 and I get 1 times dx is dx. So I get to replace the dx with a 1 half cosine theta. So the bottom line is we wind up having to do the dx times this stuff. We get an eighth times a half is a sixteenth times two thirds is going to be um, I was a 16 times 2 thirds is going to be 1 24th if I didn't make an arithmetic mistake. I have the integral here. We'll leave that alone. And then we multiply the cosine times the cosine to get a cosine to the fourth power of theta. I want to double check that. But I'm, I know that I'm going to die before I get a chance to here. And then, and then from, from there, if we want to, we can plug in the 0 and 1 and try to change the bounds of, into, uh, of integration over here. Um, so we could change the bounds of integration. I'm going to leave it dot, dot, dot at this point because my computer is really bogging down. But that's the idea. Use symmetry to get a 0 down here if you can. And in this case, we can. Um, be flexible with thinking about this upper limit of integration. You want to be able to complete the square to visualize it this way or this way and recognize that those mean the same thing. This allows you to set up the triangle with a constant on the hypotenuse, which is really nice. And we're still going to wind up with that fourth power of the cosine function, which means we're going to need to use uh, power reduction identities to be able to deal with that. So it sets up very similarly similarly to the video we did two videos ago where we did the volume under a paraboloid. You can see that the process is actually playing out nearly identically in terms of the integration process here.